Yeah, we'll do it at 12, 1240. Sorry, it's long. Five to 10. Welcome everybody to the winter 2022 public program. First, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. My name is Jason Nguyen, and I'm an assistant professor and the chair of the public programming committee here at Daniels. We are delighted to stop, start off our winter program this afternoon. Through a series of book talks, panel discussions, lectures, and symposia, our aim is to foster a meaningful dialogue on the important social, political, and environmental challenges that confront our world today. How might we create new knowledge and leverage it as a tool for critical reflection and ultimately collective change. Our programs and the difficult questions that motivate them address a range of topics that are central to what we do. Design and social justice, building technology and climate change, urban development and real estate, community resiliency, among others. I will pass it over to Dr. Sandy Smith, professor and director of our forestry programs here at Daniels. Thank you, Jason. I'm really delighted to welcome you all to Forest for the Trees, the Tree Planters, with our incredible guest, Rita Leisner, an award-winning visual artist, author, photographer, educator, and documentary filmmaker whose practices grapple with these themes of sustainability, recovery, community, and resilience. Rita is an interdisciplinary practitioner theorist whose background is in comparative literature and documentary photography. She is known for her, best known for her war photography from around the world with a collection of her work spanning 15 years in the Canadian War Museum. Today, she's going to talk to us about her new work now in the National Gallery of Canada and the Royal Ontario Museum. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Rita Leisner um, to our talk today. Um, Rita, I am not sure how we got together, uh, uh, you as an artist and myself as a scientist, but I'm sure it has something to do with our essential connection between the beauty and awe of the natural world and our shared desire to understand how it works and a passion for solutions to its environmental and its social challenges. Over to you, Rita. Uh, okay, so I think people can see me now and and you um yep. hi everybody uh thanks so much for the introduction as well jason um the the fact that daniels is this interdisciplinary faculty really made it the perfect place for this talk and as you realize sandy is a scientist and for for our forester and i'm an artist and so how did we get together um uh so in fact my stepmom went to see Sandy, went to a talk in Toronto and Sandy spoke and and my stepmother went up to her after and said, oh, my stepdaughter wants to make a project on tree planting. And do you would you be willing to talk to her? So I sent Sandy a kind I researched Sandy online and I sent her kind of a almost a fan message, fan email saying, can we meet? And we met and uh, almost right away up at the faculty at U of T and talked for hours nonstop. We couldn't run out of things to talk about. And one of the things she said to me was, you can't plant a tree if you don't believe in the future. And it resonated so much with me that I kept that idea in my mind for the longest time, this sense of that you have to have some kind of hope for the future. And of course, this doesn't apply just to, uh, to planting forests, but to everything in life, you know, and we experience a lot of that 
during COVID, you know, feeling uncertain, if we're not certain about what the future is, sometimes it's hard to get out of bed. So it's really this, this idea that you can't plant a tree without believing in the future is central, not just to the science of for reforestation, but all to, also to like the, the philosophies behind the way that I'm approaching this project. Um, so I myself planted trees for 10 years. That's what brought my interest into this subject back in the 1980s. And for decades after that, well, I'd be after tree planting, I went on to become a, a, a documentary photographer and artist and, uh, and war photographer. And I often thought about going back one day to tell this story. And a turning point sort of happened for me in around 2015, when I was getting really tired of working in war zones and uh, tired, meaning I was becoming kind of psychologically damaged. And I, and I was tired of, of uh, telling only kind of hopeless stories. And I was teaching part-time at U of T at the time. And I thought, God, I'm running out of anything hopeful to tell my students. And, and that's not really what I want to share with the world. So I thought, well, it's time for me to, to go back to the world of tree planting and, uh, and tell this story. And, uh, and of course, as a responsible artist and documentarian, I do my research. And so it made a lot of sense for me to team up with the scientist. Um, and, uh, and I do that in a lot of my work. And, you know, we know that the audience here certainly knows this. I know that this is a very multidisciplinary audience. And we realize that we don't, uh, we don't live or operate in vacuums. And, uh, and as an artist as well, like everything, you know, one of my early mentors uh, said, our art is everything that that comes to us in life, everything we're made of, the good and the bad. And I, that always struck me as really important to realize that even, even the bad is inspiring, even the bad uh, is really important to who we are and the art we make. And, you know, maybe it's also just an excuse to, uh, to live with the bad and say, well, at least it makes a good story or it makes me the artist, the artist that I am. Um, so this project is, uh, it's about the value of reforestation and it's involved in these environmental questions, but it's also very much about uh, sort of uh, philosophical ideas of us as individuals and how we, how we go forth in the, in the world and, and make a difference. So I'm going to start sharing screen again, and uh, I'll be uh, showing you photographs and presenting for about the uh, next uh, half hour. But actually quickly before I do that, I'm going to ask Sandy, my forestry consultant on my film, because I have a film and a book and fine art photographs. I'm going to ask Sandy to, to give us a bit of the historical context about uh, tree planting in Canada and why it's important. So you're not giving me the whole hour, are you, Rita, to do the history? <laughs> not giving me like, like I maximum, do it in a short five, time. Minutes. maximum yeah. five minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to be much shorter. Uh, just an overview and a synopsis uh, for those who aren't familiar with tree planting or, or maybe have only heard the myths around tree planting. And I think, unfortunately, today it's it's uh, tagged or associated with logging and I don't or harvesting. And uh, and I don't think that's necessarily fair because I think tree planting is really about restoration, conservation and sustainability. Um, when the Europeans arrived here, um, they came with the idea of resource uh, exploration. Um, they cleared the land for agriculture. We wanted to settle. Um, in this land. And what that meant was removing trees. And of course, when you remove trees, the soil blows away, the water, uh, the land gets flooded with water because it's not held by the soil. Um, and, and so there was lots of issues. And I think uh, tree planting was on the radar. Um, but it was really more in the 1960s when industrial logging took off in Canada. And it quickly became apparent that, you know, if you take this mechanized approach, uh, to logging and tree harvesting um, for the resource, then um, it can't be sustained unless we start replanting. Trees are not in that endless supply that maybe we were told at the beginning of the 1900s. And, and government saw the need for this way back then, um, but it was really this mechanization in the 70s that led innovative foresters like Dirk Brinkman to see the need for expanding tree planting across the country. And what this meant is, putting trees back on the landscapes that are pretty inhospitable and inaccessible um, in Canada's forest landscapes. Um, and it required that we do so at sort of low cost, but of course, 
very intensive labor. And so we needed abundant labor. And of course, this meant it all had to be done by hand. So you had to get on that land uh, with your hands. Today, it's almost a rite of passage, at least in my world, in the forestry world, for young Canadians to plant trees and restore these healthy, sustainable ecosystem. Which leads me back to your tagline. Uh, I think you somewhat attributed it to me, Rita, and this is our back completely. and forth here. Oh, maybe I forgot. Yeah, I completely attributed it to you. <laughs> yeah. I've stolen it. Everybody's stolen it. Like right. it's become this meme, you know, and, and then that's how influence works, right? Like you realize that, oh my God, we do have influence if we try. Right. No one plants a tree who does not believe in the future. And that I firmly believe. <laughs> yeah. So, so off okay. you go. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and then I'm, you know, one of the many uh, young people uh, who benefited from from this culture of tree planting. I started planting when I was 20, and I planted until I was 30, and it had enormous influence on on who I became. And uh, it's crucial. Uh, Sandy says that tree planting is done by hand. Logging has been mechanized, and uh, the fact that it's done by hand. In, real people have to be there. You live in fairly remote areas in these really rugged circumstances and you build a community. And it's that community that has created the culture that, uh, you know, that is so vital uh, I, to all societies, but you really experience it in this subculture of tree planting. And, um, uh, and that's a big part of the draw. I mean, uh, people often tell me, oh, tree planting is uh, being mechanized, but it, for, for many scientific reasons, it's, it's still done by hand. And that's a big part of what's so important about it. And something that I wanted to show in my photographs, because tree planting has not always been that highly regarded, perhaps ironically, like you would think with all the uh, um, emphasis on environmental sustainability, that tree planters would be recognized for the work they do. But when tree planting began, it was considered the lowest job in the forest and no one really wanted to do it. It was kind of off season labor for the logging companies. And uh, but then when tree planting became open to this wider labor force and Dirk Brinkman had this genius idea of making it about piecework and, in, and incorporating it into high performance athleticism and, you know, the, the, like the zone space that you can get into when you, when you work in a very sort of uh, almost meditative, meditative way, suddenly loggers had been planting maybe 200 trees a day, which wasn't enough. But tree planters today, the ones I'm going to show you photographs of, can plant upwards of 1,000, 2,000 more trees a day, depending on the terrain. In really good, we call it creamy terrain, uh, my personal best, I once planted 6,000 trees in one day. Now, I was in peak physical form, um, and the land was really good. But this is what we're talking about when we think about a solution or a real way of reforesting the billions of trees that we're being told are necessary to have an impact on climate change. I mean, billions of trees are not going to be planted by volunteers planting five trees here and there. It's going to be done by, by, by high performance athletes who have this specific training. Um, so I am now going to switch to screen sharing. Am I already screen sharing? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not um, yet. No. And uh, we're going to see the beautiful uh, Daniel's logo here, screening. And, uh, and then, as you can see, you can't plant a tree without believing in the future resonated so much with me that it's become the tagline for my film, which, by the way, is going to be screening in Victoria, British Columbia in a couple of weeks, if anyone here is out in British Columbia. I've yet to get it screened in the Toronto area, but it will. So you can't plant a tree uh, without believing in the future has become kind of my my motto and tagline. So I think uh, so. Thanks, Sandy, because I never credit you with it anywhere other than in person. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's become part of public domain. Yeah. Uh, and here's the Good. cover of the book. So you know, I set out with this huge mission. Like, if I was going to put all this work into going out there, because planting trees is really hard, and photographing tree planting is really hard as well, technically, logistically, physically. So I have a feature film, a book, which as we've told you, you can buy if you want. Uh, and, uh, and then there are also fine art photographs that are like, like six feet by five feet. They're huge and heroic. And I'll tell you more about them. But uh, 
first, I want to show you a little four and a half minute video clip. And uh, if you don't have good intern, if if it's not, I think they, if it's not showing well for you, there's actually a link to it that you can look on Vimeo if you're not getting it through the, the screen sharing. Uh, and this is just to put you in a little bit of the environment that Sandy and I know very well. I mean, no one goes to these places other than people working in the forest, you know, and this is my emphasis too. Like, this is about doing work, the, you know, the work of making art, but the work of going into the forest and planting trees and seeing this world that, that very few uh, see for themselves. is something that is tranquil and inviting and beautiful lush. Here we are in a burnt forest. It's midnight and it doesn't get dark out till really 1030. Yeah, it's a little bit scary, but uh, you know, because there, there can be cougars, there can be bears. I think we are, we're a bit afraid coming into the forest. It's scary. And uh, tree planters, a lot of their life happens in the day. And that's the stuff that we see photographed. That's like the portraits I've been photographing. But at night, you live in a tent and you live in very close to the forest, in the forest. And it is scary. And there's this sort of fantasy idea that forests are these like friendly places that people go for forest bathing. <laughs> I think, well, yes, there's definitely something therapeutic about being in a forest, but most people never see or experience anything like this, let alone photograph it. So we are showing part of the devastation of the forest from the fires. And that's, that's a really big part of the story. And it's not how people imagine seeing forests. I am just so preoccupied with logistics. Like all I do is shoot and think about shooting and sleep and eat. And it's just making it happen. When you get it, it is like, it is like a fucking miracle. It's unbelievable. because it's, it's almost the only thing in life that really makes me happy. Successful photograph, that was hard to get. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure if there are 
hopefully there's some multimedia artists in the audience. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I was able to bring to this uh, film is clearly stills photography and all these uh, time lapse animation pieces that you see are photographic works like they're, you know, they're edited, they're filmic and they're full of motion. Um, but these are these this is like a photographic way of thinking it's very multimedia and then of course working with sound designers and animators to bring everything into these other levels and you know it's a way that as an artist you can bring people into the feeling of the place uh, in a way that you just can't do with words so it was something that I, I you know had been challenging myself with for decades like how am I going to represent the forest in a way that actually gives people a bit of that emotional sense of being there in a in these marginal forests, right? I mean, not to move away from uh, as much as I, I love like a pristine uh, old growth forest as much as anybody. I mean, what is more miraculous? But that these these images and this world is is uh, more psychologically complex. These are these are damaged places that are in need of renewal. They're part of our generation cycle as well because fires are also natural. Um, so I'm really trying to get at the the psychology behind it as well and the psychological effect of being in these places, being in these forests, which can be rejuvenating, but also, uh, you know, co complicated. And I use the word enchanted forests to talk about these this series of photographs of these marginal parts of the of the cutting area um because i'm trying to refer to to fairy tales but again the psychological way in which fairy tales are about about growth and coming of age and transformation perhaps more than anything and so here are uh just some stills to look uh, at a bit more of these photographs that i that I made of these marginal spaces in the forest. And uh, to, uh, to bring it back to Sandy for a minute, when I was taking these photographs, which, um, so if you can imagine, you've got a, we all know what a clear cut looks like. I think we can imagine a clear cut. And what is on the edges of the clear cut? So on the edges of the clear cut is where I'm photographing. These marginal transitional places, or just places that for some reason or another were not cut by the logging area, uh, logging companies. And what are they, uh, what are they scientifically? So I sent them to Sandy and I said, I said, Sandy, what are these places that we're looking at? We're not in the middle of an old growth forest, but these are these curious marginal places on the edge of cut blocks. And, and why are they there and, and what are they? And what did I say, Rita? <laughs> uh, and then you said, you said that, uh, well, a lot of it are areas that were maybe uh, left behind because when they plan out for logging, they leave certain corridors open, or perhaps it was the time of year it was made, perhaps the ground was too wet and swampy and they couldn't go to a certain area, maybe it was inaccessible for those reasons. Um, Excellent, and then, perfect. Right? And, uh, and sometimes they're, uh, uh, they're, they're, burned areas like this. So this is one of the photographs that we made during that night sh shoot video, which was unbelievably crazy and grueling and cold. I mean, it was almost freezing by the end of the night and uh, we're very far from any kind of camp or outside radio contact. We are legitimately afraid of cougars and bears. So most of the time we're blasting music out of a small portable uh, speaker that we have because you know, someone had told us that, oh, if you play loud music, it will scare the animals away. And I'm not sure if it actually does. And uh, I don't know if any of my crew are listening today. I don't think so. But they're like, should we be afraid? I'm like, oh, no, no problem at all. Like, for sure, this will keep Then I'm like, I'm thinking, I don't really know that for sure. But I'm going to make a, you know, so maybe that wasn't quite right of me. But um, so uh, and then uh, to go back to influences and you know these photographs don't come out of anywhere i've 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 uh, i've uh you know i'm using a lot of lighting to make them i'm looking for a specific kind of realer than real feeling you know and this is what makes it 
you know, art and not reality is I'm changing what I'm seeing using the technologies available to me as a photographer. And I'm coming at it with a vocabulary of art history references that when you look at the images side by side, you can see very clearly that as I'm working, as I'm photographing or looking at anything in the world, as we all are, we look through, we look at the world through the lens of the references that we have. And for me, a lot of that is the art history, the images I looked at while working on this project in particular, that, uh, that of course is very important to the idea of you know, raising the work to the level of art, which I wanted to do and, and wanting the photograph to be you know, suitable to exhibit in museums because I am trying to raise the level of, uh, of how tree planting and tree planters are viewed in the national consciousness in the worldwide consciousness. I mean, why is it that heroicizing soldiers is never questioned? But then I start heroicizing tree planters and I get criticized for it, believe it or not. And I've, I've, I've been criticized for portraying soldiers as vulnerable. 18 year old soldiers in Iraq, when I'm like 25 years older than them and people saying, oh, you're disrespecting them by making them look vulnerable. And I'm like, what is, what's with that? And then people say, well, how can you heroicize tree planters? They're just working for the logging companies and the trees they're planting are gonna be cut down. Well, for one thing, the tree planters exist independent of who they're working for. And I'm looking at tree planting uh, in one way as kind of a sport because I respect it having done it, having been an athlete myself, I was an alpine ski racer when I was younger. And in fact, a lot of alpine ski racers um, plant trees because it's uh, it takes a lot of lower body strength because you're carrying around these very heavy bags, uh, saddle bags of trees. And uh, and you know, so I'm I'm trying to, this is part of my my mission, right? And why why do we glamorize and heroicize killing but not planting trees, despite all the awareness of the environmental movement? And you know, sometimes I think, well, who has created a divide between tree planters and and the environment and environmentalists? And we and tree planters, we I still think of myself, I guess, as a tree planter, have always been kind of stuck between loggers who saw us as uh, as you know hippies from the cities in the south. I'm dating myself, hippies, whatever. And uh, environmentalists who see tree planters as cogs in the in the wheel of the of the uh, of the logging industry. Um, and you know, but the fact is, someone has to plant these trees. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Because yeah, they're they're heroic. And uh, as someone who's appreciated athleticism my whole life. I photographed them also through that eye. And when I watched them plant trees, I had a real appreciation for the, the dance almost that they're performing through the cut block when they're really at the top of their game. And of course, I only photographed the top, the fast tree planters, because you know, if you're making a movie about ski racers, you're not going to go to the bunny hill and photograph people who are just learning because people sort of said, Oh, why isn't there more emphasis on the rookies? Well, that's not that's not really what I'm I'm trying to show. Um, and then here are some of the uh, photographic influences on me. I'm certainly not the first person to have uh, to have photographed tree planters. So uh, Ottawa artist Lorraine Gilbert is photographing tree planters in the 80s. And this is when I'm beginning as a tree planter and also starting to become interested in being a photographer. And so she's been hugely influential to me as a tree planter, as an artist. I'm really lucky that we've, uh, we've met and uh, become friends in subsequent years. Um, and but you know she's working in the 80s she's also a tree planter she planted for longer than I did and would plant half the week and take photos half the week and she had a special tent for her gear she's also using a medium format camera like I am um, and then uh, she starts bringing in these back, back Muslims and uh, and removing the subject from the contacts and this is a photographic style very typical to the eight of typical to the eighties that became popular in the eighties. And so, you know, we all work in a time zone and the photographs I made, I could not have made if the technology I was using had not been invented as late as 2016, the camera I was using with its various abilities uh, and the lights I was using with their various abilities weren't even invented until around 2014, 15, 16. So that's also, also very important. Um, and then uh, just to show you where Lorraine is working from, 
Uh, many, most of you will know Richard Avedon, who's best known as a fashion photographer, photographed all the well, rich and famous, but he also took his practice into the real world, which is my, my studio is the real world. And, uh, and here he is doing his trademark, removing the subject from the contact. So he's going out into this is very famous work he did in the Western United States. And he's in these farms, these incredible environments, and he's removing everything and he's shooting them against a white backdrop. And uh, you can see him at work with his very cumbersome, very slow moving uh, large format camera, which of course for my work, I couldn't have used a large format camera um, because I'm moving. And, uh, and these are, so this is very influential at the time. Um, and uh, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm sort of going to start, but I think I'm okay for time. Okay, so also in the 90s, I started uh, collecting art by and about tree planters, myself and two friends of mine, Gavin Dandy and Matthew Ross. We were coming, we were at the end of our own 10-year tree planting careers, and we, we put together this body of work and Canadian Geographic picked it up. And as you can see, we're publishing Lorraine's photographs. We're publishing photographs by uh, other photographers we'd met. I was very, we're all very obsessed with our hands tree planting because you work with your hands and you hurt your hands when you plant trees. And, uh, but this is just to show you that, you know, it's been in my head long before I was uh, a collected artist in national institutions. Uh, I had been thinking about the art, the way of telling a story of tree planting through art. So then 22 years later, jump forward to the cut block. And here I am now trying to make these photographs, these 21st century photographs uh, of tree planters using all the technology now available to me and all the physical wherewithal I can muster. <sighs> You're out in the block all by yourself and you don't see anybody all day all you have are your trees and your land and i always thought that everyone else was planting more than me and going faster than me and that would push me and i would just be like you're too slow you're too slow everybody's ahead of you and i would just like work and work and work and at the end of the day i would feel like i had just fucking blown it and i was a complete loser and then I would go home or get on the bus and find out that, you know, not only like maybe I'd even highballed the camp. And it's a strange kind of motivating thing, the sense that you're never, you're, you know, you're never doing good enough. So there's always a sense of urgency and you always have in your gut this kind of feeling that you have to work harder and better and you have to be more prepared for every moment. And it's one tree at a time you keep going regardless of feeling discouraged. You just can't let yourself think about that. It's just the next thing, plant the next tree. And at the end of the day, you've planted all your bags. You've, you've, uh, you've filled in some land, you've made some money and you know, you plant trees for 10 years and you've planted a forest. Um, okay. So, uh, I'll tell you everything I say in that clip, I'm talking about tree planting, but that conversation started because I was out in the bush and I was trying to get a photograph of something and it was very frustrating. We had tried for two days, we didn't get it. And I broke down crying and I said, this is too hard, fuck this, the hard, as hard as I work, I can never achieve what I want and everyone's doing better than me. And, and my assistant Liam says, I said, I said, every other photographer and artist is doing better than me. And Liam says, I don't know who you're talking about. And I'm like, well, it's just like tree planting, I guess. And then I, I'm like, yeah, I guess when I was tree planting, I always felt everyone was doing better than me. And that's what motivated me. And I'm not saying that's a good, that's a good thing. I don't think it is, but it's certainly a big part of what drives me as an artist. And, uh, and it's what drove me as a tree planter. And it, it's, uh, you know, probably something I need I need therapy for, but uh, and now I'm going to show you some of the the photographs that come out that came out of that work. This is one of the ones in the National Gallery of Canada, which I'm, you know, I'm so proud of because 
I have I have footage I never I never published of me a lot of footage of myself working on this project because I spent four years photographing and filming to make the photographs and uh, and the film. It's all happening simultaneously in in these four this uh, actually three years from 2016 2019 four years in the bush and um, and saying you know like is anyone ever going to give a shit about this? Like, is the National Gallery of Canada going to give a shit about this? So when they actually purchase very, very large scale images of these for their national collection, where they will hang, by the way, with Lorraine Gilbert's uh, highly influential and wonderful photograph. So, um, oh, this is, by the way, this is Laurence Morin, who's also a tattoo artist. And uh, she gave me a tattoo, which, which uh, I get in my film. And uh, so, this tattoo that I have, it's a, a forest on one side and on the other side, it's a clear cut. So even my own body is, uh, is, uh, is written on with this story I'm so uh, co compassionate, passionate about of, of being aware of the damage and taking responsibility for it. And that it's not, it's not a simple black and white. We are constantly involved in having to take responsibility for our, our actions. And covering war zones is a similar kind of thing. Yep, lots of. Uh... And then uh, these are just kind of fun, these next couple of pictures. So when I was a, a child and uh, was ski racing, you know, very amateur level, but I took it seriously. I, I dreamed that one day I would go to the Olympics, which I quit, you know, that was never going to happen. But uh, I had posters of my heroes on the walls of my bedrooms. And I don't know if you can see, but to me, there's a very big aesthetic relationship between the way that these, these skiers are, are poised with their ski poles to go around the gates and the planter with a shovel in one hand and a tree in the other. And, you know, these are shot with long lenses from great distances and I'm up close, you know, with a flash, but this is part of the, the aesthetic I'm trying to get right in there into the athleticism of these images. Um, and uh, so my obsession with hands goes way back. And I, for this project, I thought long and hard about how was I gonna photograph hands? And I came up with the idea of it, it being from the perspective of the tree planters. And so to make these pictures, I had them kneel on the ground and hold their arms way, way up high. And we stood behind them with our strobe light and my camera. And then I made this series of, uh, the tree planters hands there's a big spread in the book of these actually and you can see the tree planters the tree planting tattoos are a really big part of the culture and uh uh, you won't be able to read in the book you can read or when these pictures are bigger, but I'm going to read to you what her tattoos say. Uh, the one on her arm says, we worry about the future, which I think, you know, it's so powerful and amazing too to be able to work with these, uh, you know, young uh, millennials, younger than me. I mean, there's almost 30 years difference between me and many of them. And, uh, and the one on her wrist says, for a moment there, I lost myself. Um, And uh, so I'm going to end with another uh, little video. This is uh, uh, three minutes long, three and a half minutes long. It's a, one of the tree planters named Stephanie, who, uh, yeah, I'll just let, I'll let Stephanie tell you about uh, tree planting and what it means to her. And then uh, we'll be getting pretty close to the, the Q&A after that. So here you go. This is a job that hurts and no one's making you be here. So you have to like it a little bit. People say it all the time, like you can't be a tree planter unless you kind of like pain. 
there's this kind of idea around um, like planting without gloves is more hardcore and like that kind of pain, like people like that, like when you get really cut up, you're kind of proud of it can be healthy and it can not be healthy. I think that also comes with knowing your body, knowing when something hurts too much. There's a difference between being in pain and hitting your limit. That's like something that rookies have to learn really fast because then you get injured. You have to know what kind of pain that your body can take. Well, I started self-harming when I was pretty young for about 10 years. It kind of peaked when I was 16 or 17 everything is so overwhelming that you feel like you have no other way of doing things. I didn't really think of it as a problem at the time because I was always really functional. I was always working really hard. And if you didn't know me, it wouldn't look like there was very much that was wrong with me, which is ridiculous. It took me a long time to get comfortable wearing a t-shirt. People don't really know how to react. Um, people usually don't ask me about it because people usually don't know how. And I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder around that time, which is definitely interesting to have planting because everyone talks about the highs and lows of planting, how one of the things that they like and they find really refreshing is like, you see everyone at every point in their day and in their life, like their highest highs and their lowest lows. And that's not something that they get anywhere else. Whereas for me, I feel that every day, it doesn't matter where I am. For people who deal with depression or anxiety, like, Problems feel so big and vague. Sometimes it's easy for small problems to feel like the end of the world. And tree planting is, I think, really good for that because your problems are right in front of you. Okay, the land is bad. Okay, there's a lot of slash. Okay, my bags are heavy. Like all of your problems are so, I don't wanna say easy to deal with, but they're right in front of you. And at the end of the day, they're gone. And I think that's almost refreshing for people whose problems never go away is you get to finish a day and it was even if it was really hard and even if you had the worst day ever it ends for i think for any young person spending eight plus hours a day every single day for months in your own head can be very valuable um i think we live in an environment that's so fast-paced and so overwhelming that we don't get to think a lot about like our lives in your 20s, like, you don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, everyone is so confused all the time. And I think everyone pretends to know what they're doing and tells people they know what they're doing, but, like, nobody knows what they're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You just hope that it works out. Tree planting has definitely made me an, a more interesting person and a better person because you just have so much time to think about the things that you're doing. And I don't think a lot of people get that time. Okay, so I'm now going to uh, stop screen sharing and uh, we are going to open up to the Q&A. Sandy has some questions, I know. Uh, there's there's actually uh, some in the Q&A, Rita, so. Oh, there you go. Yeah, what a fantastic, thank you. A wonderful uh, overview of the land and the people in the land. It, it's really impressive and um, I will, there's a, a couple of thank yous and, or many thank yous and a couple of questions, but um, you know, it, it strikes me and I, this is again, seeing your work cause I've seen it for a while, but you've got all these different media. Like you seem to be really expanding uh, in a way from the still photography into these other um, media. Uh, do you think that's really important for you as, a, as an artist to, to push that boundary a little bit? Mm -hmm. Or is it just the subject that sort of, you know, pulls that out? Uh, well, so I made a short film 10 years ago where I also incorporated stills photography. And, you know, stills photography became my chosen art form for, you know, many reasons. But a lot of it was just accessibility. I mean, I didn't study art in uh, school. And... Uh, you know, I went to a really academic school, the Toronto French School, and we didn't have art, actually. And then, uh, and then I went to, I switched and I went to a school called Victoria Park Secondary. And the first thing I did was sign up for a photography class. But my father always took photographs. And, you know, photography now, of course, more than ever, is so highly accessible as a, as a way of communication. 
And, um, and, but I also worked in the film industry for seven years as a lighting technician. And so my photography has always been heavily influenced by my appreciation and understanding of lighting. So I've used flash in my photography uh, for a long time in documentary and conflict situations before it was now it's kind of fashionable to do it, but it wasn't when I was started doing it. And, uh, um, and so when I made my first film, I thought, well, well, what skills do I have that I, I can bring? Because much of this is going to be new to me. And one of the things was working on a tripod would get me around issues of how to move the camera. So my first film is all shot on a, all the film footage is shot on a camera and it or on a tripod and it incorporates very smoothly the stills and the and the video, but all shot very statically, very Avedon-esque actually, but without the muslin background, when in fact the landscape was very important. Um, so for this project, I knew I wanted to raise the bar of what I could do because I wanted to show that motion. And uh, yeah, figuring out how to create like a still frozen image of these highly fast moving subjects, uh, you know, that's kind of the technically hardest thing that happens in this, is this whole pro project is making those, but, and then figuring out how to shoot the night forest um, I definitely think uh, as a stills photographer, and uh, I know a lot, you know, I used to teach the history of documentary photography at the University of Toronto, and, uh, um, and the structure of my film, in fact, is very influenced by my understanding of photographic series and sequences, and also book sequences, like my book, for instance, which I designed myself because I'm very design conscious. I'm so highly visual and uh, conceptual. <laughs> so if you were to look at my film and my book together, it would be so clear that they were both directed and designed by the same person. They're integrated objects. They, they barely, they, I mean, they exist separately and they're both so new. I think some people know the film exists and have seen it but don't even know about the book and vice versa. And same with the fine art photographs because it's all just coming to a head like now. And um, so, yeah, I love that I, I have still photography in my toolbox. It's a different experience when you look at a picture for longer and you have a physical object, of course, is a whole different relationship. The sort of the analog, the analog version of the digital yeah. worlds that we live in. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's yeah. A, it's it's really you know this uh, animated powerful. stills you know that become sort of a a sequence as you stay, say and, as and, a story. And an unwillingness to compromise because I'm used to having you know when you have a still photograph you can't have a portfolio and be like oh well there are right. a bunch in here that aren't very good but they're there just to move the story along like that was never going to happen in my film so every you know like B roll I don't even know what that like forget it every picture had to be a winner which is partly why it took so many years because right. you have to wait for nature to deliver what you want. Yeah, I, I'm going to, I was going to, I'll come to the questions in the question chat. I will get there. Um, I can't but see the questions, by the way. In the no, I'll, I'll bring okay. them up here because so, um, I'll come to it, but I wanted to segue into it coming back to some comment. And and I made reference to it in my history of, of tree planting, but this idea of um, connecting tree planting with logging, th this idea that there's always this uh, conversation um, and it's a struggle around what we're doing out there and why and how, et cetera. But it strikes me as I look at the body of your work here today is, you know, back to the war uh, photographs. And it's not so much that you're exploring the war per se and all that uh, story that goes with that, but it's more about the people and their experiences and the place. And I think that comes through here very much to me. Again, different place different uh, project or purpose, but it's not so much about the, that, that context as what the people are in that place and how they're feeling about it. Is that fair? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yep. I mean I'm, I'm nothing if not a people photographer. So <laughs> yep. even my photographs of the, of the forest are about the, the psychological relationship to, to that space. I mean, they're, 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 not, un, they're not untouched for us, they're for us that have been touched by people. I'm very interested in how we interact with the environments we're in and the and the people around us. So, um, you know, I've I've photographed a lot of communities. I I lived with 
uh, American cavalry soldiers in the desert in Iraq for two months, me and 150 cavalry soldiers alone in the desert. I mean, I was 40, so 17 years ago. And I, I think back, I'm like, oh my God, what was I thinking? But I, I'm fine. I, I don't know. I'm, ser- I'm, I'm searching for a community maybe. And I also <laughs> spent years photographing a community of women wrestlers in the United States. So I'm always on the outside looking in and trying to understand how people work in these communal ways. And I also, there's a comfort to it and a safety, a comfort and a safety being there, but also on the outside. And tree planting actually is the first time that I photographed a community, documented a community that I was once a part of. And uh, even though many years ago, uh, I had insider uh, knowledge and, you know, tree planting is hard as I don't need to repeat. And so when they're out there working and I would show up with my can, you know, maybe I had to like hike five kilometers through bugs and rain to get there. And I get there and they're, they're struggling, they're working away. And, and now I want to take pictures of them. And by the way, I never, as you saw, I never slow them down. I can't slow the work down. It's peace work. Time is money. No one would ever allow you around as a documentarian for a long time if you were getting in the way of their work. So I never slowed them down. I'm just like, no, you don't have to do anything. I know what I'm going to anticipate your moves. And they're like, their first question was, did you ever plant trees? And I said, yeah, 10 years. And, uh, and they're like, okay. And I said, and I also was a war photographer. And they're like, okay, well, maybe we'll give you a chance. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, Very and then much. the word got around, the more I, you know, by year four, I was able to do this, in this, you know, beautiful interview with Stephanie Sinclair, who, who so generously shared her story. But at that point, I'd known her for four years. And uh, in fact, she'd also worked as my assistant. She's and now she's a filmmaker. And, uh, cool. you know, you have to have that as a doc, you have to have that trust of people. And I think that gives me energy. That's part of why I like uh, documenting people. I, I get energy from being, from interactions, like being here with you, you know, like maybe I'm nervous before a presentation starts, but I always know that once it gets going and there's an interaction, I know that there are other people there. Like I get highly energized by that. Um, but by year four, you know, that what makes a great interview is, is trust more than anything. And your, your subject has to trust that they do not need to censor themselves because once you're self-censoring, you're stilted and you miss, you miss things. So you have to trust, they have to trust me enough to know that I would censor, I would edit it in the right way that I would do the responsible thing with whatever they said and I wasn't gonna hurt them. And then that gave them the freedom to talk for hours about their deepest things and, and trust that I would present it in a respectable, respectful way. There's a um, couple more questions, but one, um, and I, it, this, it, it might be a question to me, but it will, we'll start with you and I'm going to let you answer it either way. So um, it's from a third season uh, tree planter uh, who often thinks about whether or not the fact, the act of replanting is in fact sustainable or even environmentally ethical. And it's what I tried to segue from logging, but I often his question is, I often question the practice of planting monoculture species. So this is where I say, this is, these are one of these management science questions, but have you ever come across that or thought about that? So, yeah, as you know, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. Um, you know, like a, a lot of the, the plant, I mean, when I planted trees, um, the, a lot of tree planters are skeptical, uh, as they should be, of, uh, of reforestation practices. And, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. Like, I'll start by saying that logging is centuries old and tree planting, while as Sandy pointed out, some of the, uh, uh, the science was evolved during basically farming and reforesting parts of southern Ontario. And then that science is then applied to industrial tree planting in the 60s once we realize we have to do reforestation on a massive scale. But like reforestation, the, the science was kind of there. But um, but yeah, so back in the 80s, I remember like writing on our T-shirts when we were feeling like, you know, abused by the industry before there were any kind of union regulations at all. And we were really it was brutal, brutal, like working 21 day shifts and no shelter and bad food and and having to put bleach in the water because we didn't have access to any clean water or, you know, um, and writing on our shirts, planting tomorrow's toilet paper today. Like we were deeply cynical, but I've actually since learned that um, it's not it's not that it's not that simple. I mean, 
mono, I'm going to let uh, Sandy talk about monoculture, but, you know, we're planting in areas where these are coniferous regions. I mean, these trees are actually indigenous to these areas, and that's why they, they grow so well in these specific areas. So the monoculture question, I'll let Sandy get to. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into, too, this is your, your okay, background. So, so, so generally, and, yeah, we'll and, go, uh, we'll and then it. the other thing people say yeah. is, well, the trees are just going to be cut down. So what good is that? Well, they're going to be cut down in 80 years, more possibly 80 to 100 years. And in that time, they will build ecosystems and habitats. I mean, 80 years is a long time. And and these trees, at least the ones being planted in central British Columbia and northern Ontario and Quebec, where much of the planting, this kind of industrial planting is happening. Um, the, uh, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, uh, oh, the trees uh, indigenous to these areas, like maybe they'll live 150 years if left to their own devices and say they get cut at 80, 100. Um, but, you know, they are being planted for this purpose, but these aren't like the giant redwoods that could live for a thousand years or more. Like these trees will never live that long. Eventually they, they will fall down. Um, but so, yeah, it kind of makes me sad when I hear tree planters say, oh, I'm not doing anything that's of any good. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that is what happens to tree planters after they have this experience, like the person who asked this question, for instance, obviously is changed by their experience. So maybe you go tree planting to make money to pay for university or whatever. And, uh, and you don't really know anything else about it. And you go there and you become a witness to the land and who knows the land better than the people working it. And Sandy and I talk about this a lot too. Like no one knows a clear cut better than a, a tree planter, probably even better than a logger because loggers mm -hmm. go in and cut, you know, hundreds of trees a day and then they're out of there with their machines. And, and loggers, by the way, I think have emotionally very much felt the loss of community that came with mechanization. And it would be a very sad thing indeed if tree planting were replaced by machines. Uh, we already feel this in Facebook and living the virtual worlds we're, we're living through the pandemic, you know, like connection with other people and working with your hands and feeling you're doing something with purpose is very important to how we feel about ourselves uh, as humans, you know, and so tree planters go and they are transformed by this experience. It changes their worldview. They go back into the society at large and they bring those those lessons, those worldviews with them. And then, and that by extension, they, they change the world. And forest policy in Canada and environmental uh, discussions are, are, are influenced by people, who, by many tree planters, you know, like uh, uh, Joyce Murray, for instance, who's an MP in, in Vancouver, uh, who was married to Dirk Brinkman, the father of reforestation, when they started their company. And so here's a woman who was responsible for planting the millions and millions and millions of trees, and now she's in a position of, of political importance. Or they go, tree planters go and they become foresters or environmentalists or um, or artists like me who make projects about tree planting. I mean, uh, the fact that it's so unique really that tree planting in Canada is done by, by this student or this youth community and not by the foresters themselves, you know, has to do with how this labor workforce transformation happened in the seventies, thanks to Dirk and others. And so, you know, in most countries, like in, in uh, Sweden say, like tree planting is done by foresters. And in, in Canada, it's done by philosophers and artists, you know, and this is <laughs> yeah. bound to have some kind of effect. So, so yes, I think we're absolutely, we need to question this and, uh, and make things better and work toward, you know. And, and I was, I was going to add to that, Rita, and, and it shows in your material and your, your images and your film, that a lot of it is done by women proportionately because of that lower uh, center because of gravity of the lower and that strength. Because it takes lower body strength. Yep, women, that's you right. know, can't hold giant chains chainsaws but we've got killer lower body strength and so women can plant at equal levels to men and it's very right. unique in the physical labor world to right. have this equality between men and women I, yes. mean, I can't think of many other you know it comes women. across and it's wonderful yeah. there's a number of other questions and I know I'm coming to the end here uh, one in particular was interested in your equipment and light aesthetics, but I don't know if you could talk about that. Oh, in a minute. Phase one, 100 <laughs> one minute. Pixel, the best yeah. camera you can buy. You know what? I was going out here to do this. I've been at this for 30 years. I pulled out all the stops. I have the best of everything. I've got four pro photo uh, B1 lamps. They cost almost $5,000 a piece. My camera cost $50,000. This was not an amateur production, but also I'm running around the cut block carrying all this equipment, but it's like, I made it, I made it happen. But yeah, 
Uh, I wasn't going to go out there and not make these giant scale pictures that were, you know, fuck it, they were going to be hanging in National Gallery, in the National Gallery of Canada if I had to kill myself to do it. And I certainly doubted that that would ever happen. So to, again, like when that actually happened, it just felt like, wow, it only took 30 years. But 30 years to get there. Yeah, well, so you the actually... best equipment I could get, but that's it, pro <laughs> photo and phase one. And then the yeah. film equipment, actually lower scale, uh, a uh, Sony A7S for mo much of the video. It's full frame camera and then a fabulous stabilizer that I finally, the simplest ever, it's called the Weebill and I could put the uh, Sony on it. And so all those shots that uh, look like of Stephanie that look like you're like, how does she get all those stable shots? Well, first of all, I'm pretty good on my feet too, but yeah, Weebill. Thanks, Rita. You actually did it in a minute, and we just sort of have a minute left. I wanted to thank you tremendously for this. There, there are more questions, and I won't be able to get to them. I don't know if we can actually capture them and then send them on to you, um, because I'm sure you would like to hear what... Uh, there's a number of students who are talking about how many years they've been tree planters, how many seasons they've been in it. So I think it really resonates with uh, not only the forestry students, but the non-forestry students that you know, want to share with artists. Uh, I think you and I have talked about this a lot too, but I think artists have the ability to share their passion and um, connect with people uh, more so than some of us scientists who just bring the facts. It's not nearly as exciting as some of the, the work that artists like yourself do. So thank you very much. Thank you to Rita Leisner uh, for joining us this afternoon and all of you for attending. The next event in the Daniels Faculty Winter 2022 public program, Black Bodies, White Gold, Art, Cotton, and Commerce in the Atlantic with Anna Aberinden Kesson is coming up next Thursday, January 27th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We hope to see you again online soon. Good afternoon. I don't know what happens next. Uh, I don't know. I guess the YouTube, uh, I don't know, maybe we're still, maybe we're still being heard. Hopefully not. some of the other questions? Um, let me see. Yes, hold on. <laughs>